Welcome to my channel. Today's colors are titanium white, permanent yellow light, permanent yellow deep, pyrrole red, matter lake, ultramarine blue, some phthalo blue that we're not going to use today, and ultra and uh, burnt umber usually remain on my palette. And then I'm using Cobra Quick Dry Medium. And all of these paints today are the uh, Cobra Water Mixable Oils. If you haven't given them a try, I would highly suggest them. The only solvent you have to use with these is just plain old water. I do tend to use a quick dry medium from time to time, and that's why I showed you that on the palette. Today we're concentrating on especially the clouds and the water. This video is made for, for anyone that struggles with that. Hopefully you'll find a few pointers in this demonstration that might help you to create uh, clouds and water effects in as simple a fashion as possible. Here I'm just establishing the horizon line. This is a 14 by 11 canvas panel at this point, MDF board. And it's been primed already or uh, with an underpainting of, uh, I think, let me try to think what uh, color that was, um, red oxide. And here's a mixture. This is the dark, and this is a for my darks. I usually use a mixture of the ultramarine blue along with Matter Lake. Matter Lake, uh, by the way, is kind of like a uh, a permanent alizarin crimson, and it is part of the gold um, royal talons line. You can find that uh, particular name for the color in uh, the Rembrandt, uh, Rembrandt oils, as well as their Cobra water mixable professional line. Here I'm establishing the darks that are going to produce this small uh, creek. And this is where the water feature in this small painting is going to go today. And those, um, uh, the horizon line is going to be pushed back by just a, uh, some hills, uh, as you can already see, I've sketched in some hills and then some variation in the fields that are coming towards us, the viewer. And then uh, next I'm going to establish some markings, uh, a brief sketch of where some of the cloud shapes are going to be. This is my usual pattern. I, I don't usually take time to produce a thumbnail sketch, although there's nothing wrong with doing so, and many artists are helped by doing that. I oftentimes am so passionate about getting to the painting process that I go right into doing that uh, initial sketch right on the, the painting surface itself, rather than sketching it out in paper and pencil. But everyone has their own pattern. And remember, like I've said in the, some other videos, that as you start painting, your first few marks and sketch in, you're not necessarily going to be happy with the results. You have to learn how to hold back and realize that as you continue to put stroke of paint upon stroke of paint, that the image will emerge. And you have to trust that it will. If you spend too much time in any one section of your painting trying to make it perfect, you will usually ruin the painting. At least that's my experience. And I'm especially looking to, to make a painting look effortless and with some broad strokes. And uh, in this particular painting, I'm really trying to work on practicing to, to lay the paint in and to leave it alone rather than to overdo the uh, mixing or fussing with the, the details perhaps. This is a mixture of some titanium white and a, just a little bit of ultramarine blue. This again is to establish the horizon line. I'm varying my brush strokes. I believe this is, um, I always use a hog bristle brush and flats primarily. So this is, a, I believe it's a number six. 
This is a, an inexpensive uh, Princeton brush. Princeton makes a line called Ashley. And I find that it works very well. It's modestly priced. The hog bristles hold up very well. And uh, surprising, I wondered if when I switched to water mixable oils, if that would be the case, since I'm, I'm uh, using them with, uh, with that kind of paint and, and I have not run into any problems whatsoever. You do have to realize, though, that uh, water mixable oils um, treat your brush a little bit more like acrylics in that, re in that fashion because you don't want this, uh, the water mixable oils to remain on your brush. So you really do need to make sure that you're cleaning them out uh, after each painting session. I just use basic water and uh, shop towels to first uh, wiping out the excess of oil with the shop towel and then immersing it in the water and, and swishing it around and then drying it off again. And uh, every so often I will clean them more intently uh, with uh, with some just basic uh, mild uh, soap and water. So here we go. I'm painting in this broad image, this broad shape. Remember to think in broad shapes. you notice there's only a few large shapes here. Uh, one is the shape of the clouds. One is the water feature. The other is the land feature. And then the sky. And oftentimes when you're first learning how to paint, getting to boil down the scene into just these few large shapes can really be helpful. So notice what I'm doing in this painting because it may very well help you. Notice there's no detail. I'm not trying to paint everything I'm seeing in those clouds or in the sky or even in the river feature. There's not much detail at all in the drawing and certainly in the even in the finished painting, you will not see a lot of detail. And yet it's amazing how much the, the brain will fill in that detail for the viewer. And that's also something you have to trust. That so many times when I'm doing a painting, I ruin it by, by laboring to create more detail. When what I needed to do was to trust that with just a, as few a brush strokes as possible, that I can convey the illusion of detail instead. Now here again is the mixture of ultramarine blue and titanium white. I've simply mixed in a little bit more of the ultramarine blue. And when I have my palette, I often will, will mix it right into the prior blue color as a way of judging the, uh, the value difference. And now you can't see it too well here, but uh, those strokes are all going vertical from top to bottom and I normally hold the painting brush near the end of the stick and this these are the long long painting brushes uh, if you're an oil painter that's what you need to do you want to make sure that you get some distance away from your painting so you can see it more accurately especially if you're going to be doing some plain air painting which is painting outdoors so I'm just filling in these basic areas with uh, an approximate color at this point in time. As always, remember that colors, in order to be seen correctly, have to be seen in relationship to one another. In this particular scene, notice that the cloud is, is one large mass. And so it separates a little bit of the color differentiation in the sky. And notice that the clouds run off the edges. Many times beginner painters attempt to put a, a cloud entirely in within the canvas. And oftentimes that's when you also get into trouble with painting clouds. Then they look like cotton balls. Um, most of the time when you are looking at a scene, remember that those clouds go on and on and on to either side. And so... They're essentially running off the canvas because you, as you're, you're viewing the scene, are looking at a small section of the sky. Now, here's a mixture of titanium white. And instead of just using titanium white, which 
a lot of times people try to do for clouds. The Actually, nothing is that white. And if you use just straight titanium white, your paintings will often seem too cold because titanium white is a very cold color. So I've mixed in a little bit of permanent yellow light into that mixture of titanium white to give it a warmer value. And now I'm placing it within the drawing that I had done. Notice again, I'm using a little bit thicker paint for clouds. You don't have to be as thin here. Usually you strive to have your darkest colors with a thinner shade or, or lighter touch. But with the lighter colors, you can go in with a little bit thicker paint and, and have a good result. One of the reasons I used the red oxide as an underpainting today was because of some of the greens and wanting to allow a little bit of that reddish pink color to come through. And by the end of the painting, you'll understand how effective sometimes your underpainting can be to help to help give a little bit more of a glow or light to the finished product. And so you want to experiment from time to time with underpainting. And like I said, I, I tend to believe that underpainting should be done ahead of time, even if you're going outdoors, so that the canvas or your panel board has plenty of time to thoroughly dry before you go in with your, your final coats here of painting. So here we go. Once again, I'm, I'm varying the strokes in the clouds so that um, it doesn't look too monotonous. And you notice I'm leaving a little bit of an edge to each of these clouds so that a little bit of that underpainting color will show through. Partly that gives me a guide. Uh, the underneath side of clouds as you will observe, is usually a little bit of a gray color, and that gray color can vary. Sometimes that gray color is a, a, a various shades of, of uh, gray blue. Other times it might be a gray shade of purple. In this particular painting, I've gone with a gray shade of purple is going to be the, under, uh, the underside of these clouds. And um, on this particular day, and I'm using a little bit of a, a, a reference photo to create this painting and in that reference photo and in my memory uh, it was a pretty bright day and so the color that I observed was was kind of a, a, a purplish a purplish gray and so I'm going to mix that in later on now from time to time what I like to do is I'll get these larger masses done but I'm not gonna fuss over the edges yet. You notice that basically the cloud color is just sitting there in that space of the drawing that I made on the canvas itself. And now I'm leaving that uh, section alone and I'm going to be looking at the uh, land mass and mixing up a green with the permanent yellow light and a little bit of ultramarine blue. And now I'm beginning to lay that green in. And once again, I realize that I'm going to shift these colors later on as the painting progresses. I'm not trying to lay down perfect color at this point. In fact, many times your painting will actually look better if you do not like <laughs> the, the initial color that you've laid down. Because then you're going to go back over top of it with something a little bit closer to the uh, color and value that you were seeking. But in the process of doing that, you're creating variety in terms of the colors on the canvas, right? And giving it a little bit of a break from, from a solid color. It would be pretty boring if I had stopped right here, correct? And I'm just painting one green and all the grass is going to be one color and all the blues are going to be one color and, and so forth. But in the initial lay-in of the color, I'm trying to approximate what I'm seeing 
and then I can always come back and, and rework it. That's the one great thing about oils or even water mixable oils is the ability to go back in and work into the color. Now here I've just, you've noticed that that green that I'm putting on now is a little bit shade darker than what I previously put on. Uh, to emphasize the fact that as the grass is coming closer to the viewer, it actually becomes darker and a little bit richer with variety and a little bit uh, more saturated with, with, the, uh, with red. So this mixture has a little bit more ultramarine blue and just a touch of Matter Lake in it. Once again, now I'm just varying the brush strokes a little bit to emphasize the, the land mass. And as the land mass is coming towards me and the greens, the grass is becoming taller. And so in order to emulate that on this flat surface, I have found that one of the, the easiest ways to do that is then to begin uh, changing your strokes from a horizontal stroke to a vertical stroke. Now I'm mixing in some more ultramarine blue to further darken the green. And that will also help to push back those lighter greens near the horizon line to make the horizon line look like it is farther away from the viewer. And isn't that amazing that that can all be done by simply varying your colors. And of course the uh, saturation level or the tone of the color. Always good to take a break once in a while to look at the design and the colors that are going on to see if you are on the right track. Notice I created this uh, pool of color that's more of a, a groundish, chocolatey uh, mess, if you will, and uh, decided at that point to just start over with a new pile in order to create the kind of green that I really wanted. And, and that may happen to you on time to time. You will be trying to approximate a color. You put a little bit too much of one color into it, and you've created um, mud. And the best solution is to realize that uh, the color on the palette never has to go back onto the painting. So, so in this case, I, I just left it on the palette for a while and did nothing with it. So here is the green, the darker green that I actually wanted to mix in the first place. And notice again, uh, like I mentioned, the vertical uh, strokes to, to indicate uh, grass that is taller as it comes forward. This is not a manicured lawn that someone is, is uh, cutting with a, a riding mower. This is a scene in, in the wild nature. And so I want to give the viewer a sense of the expanse of this landscape and the variety of the uh, vegetation that's growing. And then uh, we don't necessarily want a real strong line between the two greens, so at uh, various points you'll see me go in and soften those edges, but, but normally I don't soften those edges right away. I'm just trying to get approximate colors and to cover the canvas in oil as quickly as I possibly can. <laughs> this will um, certainly benefit your plain air painting when you paint outdoors. You'll want to move as quickly as you can to capture the light. <laughs> and here I'm sorry that you, you can't see every stroke that I'm making, but I'm going back into uh, those certain areas and, and blending the, the grasses together. As you can see there, I'm, I'm trying to soften the edge of that boundary. <coughs> Excuse me. And there, uh, clearly, you see that I did the same on the other side. And, of course, um, this is a field, and so there, there are various places in the field where uh, there may be some rocks or some other ground where the 
grass isn't quite as high or as higher than in other places. And so uh, to produce a little bit of variation in, those, uh, in that large color piece, I've introduced uh, a different type of green, a little bit darker green, uh, across a, a little bit of a stretch of that field, as you can see there. And now, just using uh, different brush strokes, I'm trying to create the illusion of, of some movement in these grasses that are, that are closer to the viewer. Now I'm just wiping the brush off as best I can with a shop towel. That's always the best way to clean your brush, is to wipe it off first with the towel uh, pulling pretty hard on there to, to remove it. And then you can give it a swoosh. I've got a, a collapsible water can that I use in my Maybeth uh, full easel, a French easel, and uh, to, to further clean it off after I've first removed a lot of the excess with the uh, paper towel. Now here I'm filling in the, the distant hills. This is um, a grayish uh, purple created with some uh, Matter Lake along with ultramarine blue and then grayed down with some titanium white. Just kind of varying my brush strokes here. I don't want these edges to be too sharp. I want to create a little bit of contrast between the green grasses and the sky and also to push it back as much as possible to give you the illusion of distance which is often a feature of good landscape painting right it is producing a sense that you're looking at a painting not necessarily of an object but rather the effects of light on the objects and in particular one of the things that people find so appealing about landscape paintings is the sense of, of distance created on a flat surface. Now I'm just kind of going back over a couple of areas of that, making sure that the line is, is horizontal, but yet at the same time uh, varied. Now I'm wiping the brush off, and now, now I will begin to focus my attention on a couple other sections of the, the painting, the, the water. Now this is also a mixture of the ultramarine blue and the Matter Lake to create a very dirty gray purple. And because it's water... One thing that uh, can help with the illusion of water is to paint the water only in the vertical strokes, downward strokes, saving any detail work for horizontal strokes at the very end of, of drawing the water. Now that um, I've done the banks of this water a little bit, I'm going to go in with um, a grayish blue as opposed to purple. And you can see now that a lot of the darks have been obliterated by, by my previous painting, and that often does happen. And I will go back in here in just a minute and add some darker darks back into the painting. But first, I believe I'm going to, if I remember right, I'm going to tackle the uh, the bare spot there in the water. So now I'm putting this uh, gray blue into those places where where we only see the underpainting at this point. Notice uh, even though I'm varying the brush a little bit, those strokes are going straight down, giving the illusion of reflection. It's also a little bit darker, and it's meant to be darker, than the sky. The land should always be the next darkest compared to the sky. And then, of course, anything that is vertical, like trees, mountains, if they're close up, or even foliage, 
should necessarily be darker and more varied with strokes. Now here I've almost covered the entire canvas now. And once I've done that, then it is often the matter of going back and looking at the edges and the other shapes. Now here, as I step back for a minute and take a look at it, I notice that I've obliterated some of the darks. And so now I'm taking the ultramarine blue and the matter lake, which is a, a dark kind of crimson red permanent paint and mixing that into my blue pole so that I can, uh, oh, I'm getting ahead of myself. This is a little bit darker but more vibrant blue to work in some highlights on the water. Once again, notice that my strokes are going straight down, which helps with the illusion that this is water and not something else. And once again, notice that varying the colors in certain sections can really really provide some highlights for you. So can contrast. One of the things that we find appealing about oil paintings is the contrast between darks and lights. Now I'm just going down and feathering out some of the some of the color variations there. Now I'm happy with the water as it stands but in order to bring that water forward a little bit more, I'm now creating that darker mixture to replace the darks into the painting. So this is ultramarine blue, and then, as I said, the matter lake, creating a very dark purple, which uh, without adding titanium white, uh, you might even think that, they, that the uh, color was black. And now I'm reestablishing this bank and of course the bank is also being reflected into the water and so these strokes as well are strokes that I'm making which are vertical not horizontal and then I want to um, get a sense that this bank is going over past where the water line is uh, maybe perhaps hidden from our view and yet uh, maybe trickling in from another another portion of the of the landscape. Notice how that is making the um, the water seem a little bit more realistic here and certainly more vibrant as this dark is, is creating the contrast between those greens and the blues creating the illusion of a little bit of a shoreline here that's stretching across the canvas and obviously um, this water element is also leading the viewer into the painting, into the distance. And so you're, you're kind of following that shoreline right into the painting, right? Kind of creating a, a Z pattern. So you're going in from the, the right side of the painting, uh, going to the, about the midsection, and then where you see the variation in the, in the grass greens, you're being taken over to, to look at the uh, distant hills, and then finally upwards towards the clouds in the sky. Here just varying that line a little bit in the uh, grasses to make it not so predictable. Pretty happy now with the foreground and the mountains and the light sky but I'm going to now go back in and focus on these clouds. So. How, how can we really get realistic clouds? So I let it sit for a little bit. Now notice this is a completely dry brush and I'm going around the edges, just pulling the paint in and out, uh, deliberately trying to be as random as possible. Clouds are after all random. They, they can be of any shape that you want them to be. No one's going to know what those clouds necessarily actually look like on the day that you were painting uh, or even if you were using a, a reference uh, photo or not. And so notice I'm obliterating that edge and creating some, some unique shapes for the top of that cloud as it, as it sort of disappears at the very edges. 
And from time to time, if it gets a little bit too much paint on my dry brush, I'm also pulling that uh, wet paint back off. And I'm still doing a very random approach here, drawing some of that blue further into the cloud shape. Varying the brush stroke. Pulling it sideways, pulling the white up as well as down. Trying as best I can to create a natural looking uh, cloud shape, but at the same time, sort of unique in its own right. And now you can clearly see there's not as many edges. Now I'm taking the, the brush, although you can't see it as well, and I am pulling up and down with vertical strokes in the blue sky above the cloud shapes. This can sometimes help with the glare that sometimes is attracted by too many horizontal shapes in the, uh, in the sky. And so that's why I've tended to, to do that here. And now, uh, as we can still see, we can still see the underpainting on the lower side of the cloud. So now I'm going to mix up a little bit of the purple, creating uh, ultramarine blue and the uh, matter lake. And now you'll see me just ever so gently brush in just a little bit. Very little oil is actually being applied to the canvas at this time. I don't want this to be too dark or it may overwhelm everything else in the painting. Uh, the cloud is not really the focal point here. It is the, uh, the small creek bed uh, driving us into the landscape and the, uh, the blue water in that, uh, that creek bed. Now, um, I'm washing my brushes out and getting ready for, for a similar technique that I did on the top half of the cloud. I'm now going to do on the bottom half of the cloud to produce uh, some some gray shades like you would normally see in most clouds even if those clouds are not rain clouds and here we go once again i'm varying my brush strokes here softening the edge as i go along and trying to do this as randomly as possible so that it looks more natural rather than uh, me trying to emulate exactly something that I've I've seen before here just just pulling that purple up and down creating some some different shades by the intensity level to which I am brushing into it some places a little bit more purple than others or a little softer than others and pulling uh, pulling those strokes up and back and down And notice how how easy that was. So with a few simple mixtures and some random uh, strokes, it's uh, fairly easy to create some clouds that, that look pretty natural. At least I hope it looks natural to you. At the same time, with uh, we've also, I hope, created some interest in each area of the painting. And so I appreciate you watching the video today. Remember that if you like the content, uh, please subscribe at the very end. You'll have a button that you can push to subscribe, so please do. And um, there will also be other videos that I've produced along the way. And I uh, hope that you will watch some more of these painting demonstrations. If you're interested in this painting or other paintings, I do sell them on eBay. Uh, just look under uh, David uh, W. Poe or David Wesley Poe, and you will find my paintings for sale. So once again, thank you for your time and your attention in watching today's video. I'll be back in the next video.